Southwestern family of companies welcomes you to the Action Catalyst. Each week, our diversely and amazingly accomplished guests share their insights and inspirations to help us ignite our own. So let's invest attention together to breathe, to reflect and refocus, and decisively defeat that voice we call Mr. Mediocrity. Then let's enjoy moving forward to make a positive difference in our world. This episode is brought to you by Thinking Ahead. Thinking Ahead's diverse team of executive recruiters specialize in executive level talent acquisition in the world's most competitive and sought after industries. As an employee owned company, Thinking Ahead has award winning consultants widely recognized as subject matter experts in their respective specialties, including banking, life sciences, healthcare, nonprofit, IT and gaming, energy, legal, security, and sales. Since 1982, Thinking Ahead has built expertise and delivered results that keep their clients engaged year after year. They believe that recruiting is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Their wide-ranging expertise enables them to ask the right questions, arrive at the best answers, and deliver desired results quickly. They continue to excel on their mission to connect the right people with the right organizations at the right time. Visit thinkingahead.com to learn more about how our specialists can help you recruit top-level talent, or serve as a trusted advocate in your career search. If you're looking for a change or looking to get a start, there's a place for you at the Southwestern family of companies. We invest in our employees using industry best practices to help you refine your skills, take control of your vision, and build your own independent business. We build principle-guided businesses by recruiting purpose-driven people. And if that sounds like you, we'd love to talk. Head to southwestern.com and click on Opportunities to review our mission, learn about our culture, and see how a place of the Southwestern family of companies can help you create impact in your career and the world. Welcome to the Action Catalyst. This is Dustin Hillis, CEO of Southwestern Family of Companies. And today we have Peter Warmica. Peter is the former CIA agent that specializes in human hacking and now uses that knowledge to help businesses assess their vulnerability to foreign intelligence groups, criminals, and other threats. Peter is a professor at Webster University where he lectures on counterintelligence and cybersecurity. He is the founder of Counterintelligence Institute. He is also the author of the book, Confessions of a CIA Spy and the Art of Human Hacking. Welcome to the Action Catalyst, Peter. Thank you very much, Dustin. I appreciate the opportunity. It's an honor to be on the podcast. Oh, we're well, so glad to have you. And I think the first question I have is the same question that probably all the listeners are thinking right now. How are you able to talk about being in the CIA? I thought they had to kill you or something if you talk about that. <laughs> You're right. There's a lot of people that either they ask me that question or they want to ask me that question. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, it's a long process, but when you retire, it depends upon whether at some part of your life that you are openly employed by them. And I was during a portion of my career. So I had to get authorization, of course. And any time that I come out to speak or write about topics that may be new or different than what I've previously gotten authorization for, I have to go to the publication review board and get their blessing. Gosh, it's so interesting. How in the world do you have a career path to be part of the CIA? How did you find your way into that? You will not find two people who have had the exact same career path. I mean, there are some people that will pursue a career with them. They will try to find out how they can apply online. There is a website to apply. There is other people that might be through the universities when they attend, might come across the recruiter there. In my particular case, I never, ever thought I would be working for the U.S. government. In fact, when I got my graduate degree in international business, I wanted to work for the private sector. I wanted, I wanted to work overseas. There were opportunities to apply to different federal agencies, but that was not at all of interest to me until they knocked on my door and they said, hey, we're interested in your background, your area of expertise in Latin America, and we think you might be a good fit. If you're interested, we can begin the process. So it was pretty much them approaching me. Wow. You got recruited just like Jason Bourne. We know sometimes Hollywood producers will actually hire a consultant you know, from the CIA, you know, one or two, I know some of these people and then they'll ask them, okay, 
how is this done? You know, that, that? and they'll explain and they say, nah, let's go with something more, more interesting or more, you know, worth high speed. So intelligence work, I mean, it's a very, very important. It's, it was for me a very exciting career, but it's nothing quite like that. Oh, uh, well, I don't know how much specifics you can or cannot talk, but as senior intelligence officer at the CIA, what sort of threats were you surprised to find out about? Well, I mean, when we're looking at all the different types of threats to our nation, that goes from other, you know, nation states like Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and, and several others. Uh, then there's always terrorism, organized crime, a Russian organized crime and other really large criminal groups are also a threat. And these days, especially with cybersecurity, criminal activity, I mean, it, it's a threat to not only our companies, our health of our economy, but it's even to the health of the nation. So across the board, there are so many threat actors who are out there. But then when I retired, what really struck me is, wow, even in the private sector, there is so many things going on that typical companies are not equipped being able to deal with the types of threat actors and what they are pursuing when targeting companies. So with the CIA intelligence and attempts of things happening, are things constantly happening that the CIA is having to ward off and prevent? Well, I think it, it depends on lots of times who's behind the potential attack, you know, whether it's a state actor or it's a criminal group, let's say. There are other threat actors, but those would be the two largest. A criminal group is pretty much looking at conducting an attack where there's going to be immediate payback, money that they're going to be able to gain from whatever type of attack they're conducting. That's what they're looking at is financial rewards versus a nation state is looking at more of a longer term scenario where even though they can develop a capability to take out electrical grid or something worse, they don't necessarily mean that they're going to undertake that now. It could be something that's filed away to a particular time when they might want to utilize that in a particular war strategy, right? So it's sort of looking at where are potential targets, whether they're organizations or nations, most vulnerable and begin to conduct those probes and begin to put technical assets or human assets in place to be able to awaken in a time that a particular action uh, want to take place. I mean, there's been a lot of, we read about this in the press, different probes over the last few years that have been conducted by the Russians, by the Iranians of our infrastructure. There have been documented cases of this, but nothing has taken place. There has not been something that's been shut down from those. Those are more just to collect ground truth, to collect information so that they can know in a time of a war what can be done immediately versus trying to prepare for something. Wow. When you're talking about the business threats that are out there here at Southwestern Family of Companies, we actually received, I guess you would call it a hijack from some Russian organization that took one of our activity tracking systems. And I think they thought it had financial information in it and they wanted millions of dollar ransom in order to have access back to our systems. Thankfully, we had a good IT team that built a back door and we just ignored the ransom. But after personally experiencing that, it really opened up my eyes to the threats are real and they're targeting all kinds. I mean, we're just a private company here in Nashville, Tennessee that, that already had somebody from Russia targeting us. And so what are your thoughts on that and how, how often is that happening every day? You bring up a very, very valid point. A lot of times when I speak about these type of threats, sometimes I get these reactions. Well... I'm a small company. I would, they would never target me, right? They're looking at the really big companies. That's what people think. But the reality is that many times those very large companies already do have a lot of good security protocols in place. They put a lot of money into protecting their IT systems. Doesn't mean they're not vulnerable. Of course they're vulnerable, but where the threat actors then go is that they look for these smaller companies. And these smaller companies are the ones that are conducting business with the larger targets. So if I can penetrate, I mean, if a human hacker, threat actor can penetrate a smaller company that does business with a lot larger companies, they already have a lot of confidential information if we're able to penetrate that smaller organization and then use it as a conduit to get to a larger, a larger company. So I think if there was more sharing of information among firms, they would find that almost every firm out there has come across some attempts to try to uh, breach their security. Wow. It's a crazy world we live in where that is just a reality. You mentioned also that individuals 
and companies are both vulnerable to social engineering. So what exactly is social engineering and how is that a threat? I use interchangeably the term social engineering and human hacking. I think human hacking is a little bit more visual because, you know, if we're hacking, people think of hacking into IT networks, which is maybe the ultimate goal in many cases. But when we're human hacking or social engineering, we are trying to hack into the individual and utilize that individual, manipulate that individual to be able to circumvent the technology and security protocols, and procedures that companies have to be able to bypass those and to actually penetrate the organization. So over 90% of effective, successful data breaches are actually initiated through some acts of social engineering, human hacking. It is really, really prevalent out there. And only recently now are organizations beginning to start to focus on this, you know, and you might hear the term phishing. Phishing is one of several different ways that threat actors can human hack their way into a company, uh, but they are much more advanced, is evolving very rapidly to include actually the incorporation of social media, the targeting of individuals through social media and the execution of attacks through social media. There's quite a few of these that are happening, but these tend to be sort of the run of the mill where you get hundreds and hundreds of these sort of uh, attacks that are going out there and trying to find the companies that will fall for them. The tendency now for human hackers is to be focusing more and more on spear phishing. When we say spear phishing, instead of you know sending out the same email to hundreds of people, you're focusing on one individual to go into a high value target, a high value organization. And we look to identify individuals who may be targets, insider targets to actually penetrate you know, think about, and, and it, a lot of this is done through social media. What is the best way to identify insiders within an organization today? It's going to be LinkedIn. You know, we can do a search on LinkedIn. We can identify, you know, a lot of companies, probably a good 20, 30% of their employees might be on LinkedIn. It depends on the company and the industry, but you're going to find a lot of people uh, on LinkedIn who work for a particular organization. Then we can take a look at these people and try to learn as much about them as possible. What are their motivations? What are their vulnerabilities? What makes these people tick as unique individuals? Okay, because we can leverage that then in different attempts to actually uh, manipulate them. And the approaches can be through email, through an SMS text. It can be done through a social media platform. It can be done through a spoof telephone call. And it can be done through face-to-face -face encounters. I mean, there's a lot of different channels. Wow. What would be a typical result of what they're trying to manipulate people to do? This tape, for example, since I really focus a lot of this uh, as of late because it's growing, is the social media threat. I mean, here we got, we can identify the targets. We can learn about them from their different profiles, from Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. We can learn a lot about them, assess them. And then we can even develop fake profiles, fake personas online. It's very easy. It can be done in 20 to 30 minutes. And these personas can be created with the target in mind. We can incorporate commonalities with that target, you know, like maybe the having graduated from the same university, being a fan of the same sports team, having the same passion for a humanitarian cause, et cetera. Then approach that target and be able to connect with them and then be able to dialogue with them. And, and so just as an email might have a link to be clicked on, a malicious link to be clicked on or an attachment to be opened. So can these links and attachments be sent via a messaging feature inside these social media platforms? And people tend to believe them much more readily than a, you know, than a faceless email that comes in. They see the social media profile. They see the person, even though it's fake, they believe it's real. And so they could click on that link or open that attachment and that could upload ransomware or another way, you know, means of gaining access to the network. But maybe it's to elicit very sensitive information. One thing that's really dangerous and few people are aware of, different, different uh, intelligence services and criminal groups will approach targets that they've acquired on social media and pose as executive recruiters. Now think about this. Think about an individual who was working inside a company. It's a phone call from someone who claims to be an executive recruiter because real executive recruiters do this, right? Real executive recruiters use a lot of different resources, resume databanks, and especially LinkedIn. 
So they call, claiming to be executive recruiter, and saying, listen, I'm very impressed with your profile. I believe you would be a perfect fit for a position we're looking to fill for one of our clients. Of course, the position is a higher title, greater responsibility, and much greater compensation than what they're currently making. Even if they weren't looking to change jobs, they're curious. Why not? What do I have to lose? So they get together with this recruiter who is using a series of regular interview questions as well as a number of different elicitation techniques. Elicitation is a whole different skill set in its, in its own right. And it's amazing how much information they can extract from this individual during these interviews. A lot of very sensitive information and many times proprietary information. So it might be a one-off discussion and that's all they needed. Maybe they have a series of conversations with the target. And eventually, imagine this. They met with this individual a number of times, had particular jobs. They all fell, you know, these opportunities all fell through. And all of a sudden, they say, listen, I know that you had mentioned that someday you would love to be a consultant, independent consultant in, in this industry. I think I have the perfect opportunity for you. I have a client who is looking for someone who can consult on this industry. So you can stay where you are, earning your salary, earning your benefits. And you can make a lot of additional uh, money on a monthly basis and gain and cut your teeth on learning how to be a consultant. So the individual is providing a lot of really detailed, confidential, sensitive information. This can go on for months. Many times it goes on for years. Organizations are hemorrhaging this information without it being detected, without even knowing that it's taking place. It's amazing. And it works. That's wild. So what can an individual do to protect themselves? I'd like to break this down into two areas. One is minimizing your digital footprint out there in the World Wide Web. Sometimes it's difficult. I mean, whether it's an individual or a company, because people like to put themselves out there for promotion. But there's sometimes they're putting out information that makes themselves much more vulnerable. So it, they have to be very careful. The more information that's out there, the more likely they will be and become a target. Because if we're looking at an organization, there's two individuals. One of them has very little information out there. Another one has considerable amount of information. We're going to go after the person that has a lot of information about them. So limiting the information. The second, though, what's really important is trying to avoid becoming a victim to these hacking, uh, human hacking attempts. Realizing that is not when we reach out to someone, contact someone uh, via social media, for example. That's not the danger. It's when someone we don't know reaches out to us. We should really only be connecting with people that we know or with people who we can verify. It is not that hard to really verify whether or not this invitation, this person is authentic versus a fake profile. Do a Google search. Take the name of that person plus one or more other data points in that person's profile and do the search. If the only thing that surfaces from that information is that profile, it's probably a huge red flag. Believe it. I mean, I receive these on several times a week. I'm receiving profiles that I detect that they're completely bogus. It's amazing. Some of them are really sophisticated. Other ones are really basic, but there's a lot of them out there. And then obviously clicking, like if they're sending you a link to click, that's the most obvious. Absolutely. I mean, if you receive that from someone you don't know, I would never even entertain that. Even if I receive that invitation, like via email or text message from someone I know, I'm going to contact them separately and say, listen, did you send this to me? Yeah. I think that's what we need more. We need to have a sort of a means of authentication of all of our communications to include within a company. Is there a mechanism within the organization where you can just authenticate it? Yep. That would really help resolve a lot of these problems. If you're talking about doing something, especially outside of the normal, normal practice, if there's a procedure for making payments, you know, for invoices that come in and all of a sudden you receive an email from the boss saying, hey, you got to make this payment to this company. And that's sort of outside of the parameters of normal operating procedures. That's for sure something that has to be verified. Maybe there could be a dollar amount that's even established and how to go, go about you know, verifying. Is it an email? Is it a telephone call? Is it a text message? It's very important. I think that would resolve a lot of these human hacking attempts. That's amazing. Well, with our remaining time, a very relevant topic right now is what's going on in the world with politics and governments and elections and psychological warfare and these strategies that are happening within the media, within social media. And so what are your thoughts with 
is human hacking equivalent to psychological warfare? And can it be deployed on that massive of a scale? That is deception campaigns. Ooh. Deception campaigns have been around from the dawn of civilization. Ever, ever since there was a government, there have been you know, campaigns to deceive, to influence people, whether it's trying to influence their own uh, masses or trying to influence members of another state, another country, to sway them to one particular policy or belief that would be a benefit to a particular adversary, right? So these things have been going on for a long time. In this country, there's been a lot of, they call it active measures, actually. There's a few books that, that are out there that talk about this, gone back for years, especially with the Soviet Union, I mean, Russia and the former Soviet Union, that have undertaken active measures, influence campaigns against the United States, and sometimes against the, the U.S. United States allies to actually have an effect upon the United States. And I'm sure, you know, that United States, every country, to some degree, conducts these. In the case of the United States, it's more trying to create opinion about something that's that's out there, you know, trying to pull different aspects of truth that's out there to influence people versus trying, in many cases, deception campaigns, meaning trying to seed, you know, misinformation, lies within, you know, nuggets of truth, but trying to trying to sow seeds that of untruthfulness. And basically it creates fissions within societies. And you can see this right now. And it serves to weaken us. I mean, that's a great question. I wish more people would actually take interest in this topic because it is super relevant to what's going on in America today and what's, you know, happened over the last, you know, several decades, actually. So for you as a former intelligence officer at the CIA, it's obvious that what's happening right now are deception campaigns within the United States of America on our own people. No, I'm not saying that. Most of the deception campaigns that we've always focused on have been what comes in from outside. And sometimes these outside actors will utilize internal organizations, whether they be the press, whether they, you know, whether they be journalists, whether they be professors, whether they be someone that has a presence inside of a community that, you know, can be leveraged to help carry out that opinion or to, to see that opinion within society. I think with any political party, there are efforts to try to influence the public so that that party, you know, gains more and more people to support their position. So, I mean, undoubtedly that happens. I wouldn't call that per se deception campaigns, but it's influence. And so we have to be very careful, I think, for anything that we listen to, we have to analyze it. We just can't believe everything we hear or everything that we see. We have to try to filter. We have to try to understand it, try to analyze it. What might be the objective behind throwing out this piece of information, we have to really take a step back and try to analyze. Yeah, it doesn't matter where the source is coming from. Do the critical thinking and form your opinion and listen to the facts and all the things you're saying. That would be so refreshing if we did have everybody thinking that way. What do you find is the most reliable source of news or a couple of sources that you depend on right now? Well, to be honest with you, I, I've always liked BBC People might think, well, Al Jazeera, but actually I listen to Al Jazeera. Any news source is going to be somewhat biased, you know, but I think of all of all the news sources that I've listened to, they tend to be much more objective. And so I like, you know, but once again, when I listen to them, I try to also, you know, sit back and analyze it, assess it. You know, is there something behind it that could try to influence people in one way or another? That's amazing, Peter. That is literally the two that I also the exact same too. Like, exactly. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, my closing question for you is what do you believe security threats for the future will look like? And are there any trends that are emerging that you could share? I think we're going to see much more of the same, but evolving to, I mean, the various threat actors, whether they're state governments or um, criminal groups, are really, really doing very well where they're able to hack into networks. And when you hack into a network, in the old days, you know, if you try to gain access to a particular entity, you know, you're looking for maybe only a few documents, right? That you could probably procure. Now, when you hack into an organization, you got gigabits of, of information. And so all this information is being pumped out, pumped out of these organizations. And you look at even some of these massive breaches that no one really talks about. I mean, you've heard of the OTM breach, Office of Personnel Management. We have some 22 million individuals with security clearances that have had all their information sucked out. We have a lot of these breaches where tons of information has been pulled out for use in the future. So I think there's going to be a lot more 
exploitation of information that is being collected over the past several years and going forward, where you're going to see a lot more attacks, both of concern for private sector entities and, of course, to the U.S. government, just because of that amount of data that's out there. Wow. This has been entertaining, educational, a little bit scary, but also a little bit uh, more equipped with what to do if I were an individual or as a leader. So the current book is Confessions of a CIA Spy, The Art of Human Hacking. What's the best way to reach you or to find that book, Peter? Actually, a simple search on Amazon with that title or my name, well, you'll have it pop up. And it's in paperback, ebook, and even audio. Excellent. And to reach me, I mean, if anyone's interested in reaching out to me, please visit our website, counterintelligence-institute.com or my email, pgwarmka at counterintelligence-institute.com. Be happy to entertain any questions that your listeners may have. Excellent. Well, thank you for being on here, Peter. This was a very invigorating conversation. Thank you, Dustin. This is Dustin Hillis. We'll see you guys next time. If you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. To stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst Podcast and Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. Thanks for listening.